roots of Orthodox spirituality. A wondrous journey into Orthodoxy. Prepared and presented by Angeliki Antonaku Lekea. Dear listeners, we are continuing to read from the book With Pain and Love for Contemporary Men, the first volume in the series, Spiritual Councils, by St. Paisios. Pollution and the Destruction of the Environment, the Continuation They have polluted the entire atmosphere. Even in winter, we can smell the stench of garbage. Imagine how bad it gets in summer and they don't bother to send an airplane to spray with disinfectant. We are lucky that God has made flowers with fragrant aromas. All these flowers, with their various forms and sizes and fragrances, neutralize the stench. What would happen without these natural aromas in the atmosphere? It only takes one dead animal, and the stench is unbearable. God takes such good care of us. Imagine our condition if he ever abandoned us. Imagine if there were no flowers and herbs on the earth. Through them, our fetid odors are covered. We can take such delight in flowers and their aromas. Once a lay person came to my Kalivi and asked me, What do you do here day and night with all the time you have? Everything around me was in full bloom. The mountain slopes were full of flowers. There was a sweet fragrance everywhere. So I said to him, Do you know what I must go through in order to water and take care of all the living things you see? And do you see how many vigil lamps I light in the sky every night? The elder meant the stars. I hardly have enough time to light them all. He was looking at me dumbfounded. Don't you see all the lamps up there at night? I am the one who keeps them burning. How could I possibly have enough time? It is not easy with so many lamps. I need to change the wick to pour the oil. The poor soul was a loss for words. Spraying pesticides is poisonous. So many birds die from pesticides. They spray the trees to protect them from disease, and as a result, people get sick. They poison everything. Wouldn't it be better if we sprayed less and buried the rotten fruit or composted it instead of composting the good ones? Isn't it obvious that pesticide fumes harm human beings? They can be fatal for young children. This is one reason they are born sick. I once said to a visitor, What's going on? You have killed the insects and now you are killing people. They spray the flowers to kill the insects, and people get sick. Next thing you know, they will discover even stronger pesticides. What will happen to us? It has been proven that some of the insects they exterminated were actually killing other harmful insects. Now we will try to breed the good insects again in order to get rid of the bad ones. God has arranged everything so well. Wherever there are crickets, there are no mosquitoes. A person came to the Kalibi with a small device. It produced a harsher version of the cricket sound to repel mosquitoes. We killed the crickets which sang so sweetly, and now we are trying to imitate their sound, which God has made with a battery-run device. They have killed everything, the crickets, the turtle doves. It is rare to see 
even a raven today. Soon, we'll be exhibiting ravens in cages. When you spray your trees, let God help you a little. If the pesticide does not reach everywhere, it does not matter. We have all kinds of means today for so many things, but nothing to strengthen our faith. I hear people ask, Is such and such a medicine available? Where is it? Abroad? And they rush to the phone to find out how to get it. Gradually, lay people and even monastics are putting God aside. We have not put spiritual progress first. Had that been our priority, everything would be holy and good. The problem is, when it comes to spiritual progress, we monastics are no different from lay people. But Yaronda, Dacus, Ordecus, an insect, is harmful to the olive trees. Take your goboskini and pray for the Dacus to leave the trees. Do not just rely on spraying. Put some Christ in your work. We are making an effort to do things as if we lived in the world. It does not occur to us that we monastics live in a different world. We should not try to imitate what lay people do or even outdo them. Where is Christ? I am not saying that you should not spray at all, but just keep in mind that they are still experimenting with these chemicals. When you spray, wear masks. It is better to have some fruit afflicted by dacus than to try to spray everything in sight. Try to cut down on the number of your sprayings. Pray with devotion. Read the first psalm and sprinkle some holy water on the trees. St. Arsenios the Cappadocian used to read the first psalm when the people of Farasa planted trees so they would bear fruit. When you live correctly, you will get the rain you need. This was said in November of 1990 when there was a severe drought. And the caterpillars will die. God will provide for you. You need to have devotion and trust God. Chapter 2 The Era of Many Comforts in the Times of Much Discomfort in this chapter, we observe the elder's striving spirit as an ascetic monk. We also see his concern about the negative influence of technology and modern advances on the ascetic spirit of monasticism. The elder was not against civilization. He wanted to emphasize the idea that we must rule civilization and not be ruled by it. He used to say that monks especially should make limited and discerning use of modern conveniences in order to devote their full energy to their spiritual struggle. Even our hearts have turned into steel. An excess of modern conveniences is making our lives inconvenient. Machines have multiplied, and so have distractions, and they in turn have made man a machine. All kinds of machines and inventions are controlling our lives. This is why human hearts are also turning into steel. The availability of so many comforts has made cultivating a conscience in people difficult. In the old days, we used to work with animals, and this made us more compassionate. If you overloaded an animal and the poor thing knelt down from the weight, you felt bad for it. When it was hungry and looked at you imploringly, it would break your heart. I remember when one of our cows fell ill, how we suffered with it because it was a member of our family. Today, people own all kinds of devices made of steel, and unfortunately, this is also what has become of our hearts. Is this piece of iron broken? Weld it back together. Has the car stopped working? Take it to the repair shop. If it cannot be fixed, they throw it away. They have no feelings for it. After all, it's just a piece of metal. 
The heart does not take part in these decisions. This is how selfishness and egoism find fertile ground and take root. Today, we have so little consideration for our fellow human beings. In the old days, because food would spoil after a day, people would think of those who were poor. It is better to give it to a poor person than throw it away, they reasoned. A person that was spiritually advanced would even think, let the poor person eat first and I will eat later. Nowadays, people put the food in the refrigerator and do not think of those in need. I remember whenever we had a good yield of vegetables or fruit, we always shared it with our neighbors. What else were we supposed to do with all the excess produce? It would spoil anyway. Now that we have refrigerators, people think, why share it with others? We'll put it in the refrigerator and keep it for ourselves. And I will not even mention the tons of produce we throw away or bury in landfills while millions of people in other parts of the world are starving to death. People have gone crazy about machines. We constantly come up with new devices. They run faster than the human mind because the devil is there to give a hand. In the old days, when we did not have telephones, faxes, and all kinds of technology, we lived tranquil and simple lives. Back then, Yeroda, people would really enjoy their lives. Yes, they did, unlike these days when people have gone crazy about machines. People are tortured by the many conveniences available. They drown in their anxiety to possess them. I remember when I was at the monastery of Sinai. The elder was there from 1962 to 1964. How cheerful the Bedouin were. They lived in tents. Their lives were simple. They could not feel at home in Alexandria or Cairo. Their home was in the desert and in their tents. They drank tea when they could get it and praised God. But now with all this progress, they too have started to forget God. You see, they have caught the European spirit. Israelites first constructed concrete block cabins for them and then sold them whatever old car had been left in Israel. The Sinai Peninsula now belongs to Egypt, but at that time it belonged to Israel. Ah, these enterprising Israelites. Now, each Bedouin has a concrete block hut, a broken car parked outside, and lots of anxiety. The car breaks down, and they go through all kinds of trouble to fix it. And what do you think their gain is? Nothing more than a headache. At least in the old days, things were well built and lasted a long time. Now we pay so much money to buy something, and after a while it breaks down. In this way, the factories keep at it, making new things and taking people's money. We are working so hard trying to make ends meet. Machines are the brainchild of European scientists who spend their time with screwdrivers. Let's say at first they make a lid. Then they improve it by making it a screw-on lid. Next they may add a push-button device to improve it even more. Constantly, they try for a better version and for newer and more advanced machines. And before the unfortunate people have paid off the last model, they want to buy a new one, the latest and best. And of course, they end up overworked and in debt. A poor man wants to get a cheap car. He sells whatever he has, oxen, horses, and so on. The way things are going, they will soon be putting donkeys in shop windows and people will pay to see the donkeys. And so one day the poor man gets the car, but then the car breaks down, and there are no parts for it, or so they say, and so the unfortunate man is forced to buy another one. He cannot afford the best model, because it is expensive, and so he buys one that is better than what he had before, and that one will be tossed aside too, and so on. These situations require much attention. We monastics must be very careful not to fall into this rut of keeping up with the newest fashions.
television has done great damage. Yaroda, nowadays telecommunications are so advanced that one can see live what is happening on the other side of the earth. Yes, they see the entire world, but they don't see themselves. That is the only thing they cannot see. It's the human mind that destroys people, not God. Yaroda, television is very harmful. Of course it is. Someone came and told me. Television is good, father. Eggs are good too, I replied. But if you mix them with chicken droppings, they become useless. The same applies to radio and television. Today, if you turn on the radio to listen to the news, you must first put up with the songs they play. In the old days, it was different. You knew the time the news would start. You turned the radio on, and that was it. Now you have to listen to the songs first. If you turn the radio off, you might miss the news. Television has done so much damage. Children are the most harmed. A seven-year-old child came with his father to the Kalivi once. I saw the demon of television speaking through the child's mouth, exactly as demons speak through the mouth of the possessed. It was like a baby born with teeth. It is hard today to find normal children. You find little monsters, and you see they don't get to think for themselves. They only repeat what they have heard and seen on television. Television is being used to make people numb and dumb. People believe what they hear and see, and act accordingly. Yeroda, mothers ask us how they can keep their children away from television. They must explain to their children that television dulls their minds. They lose the ability to think on their own, to think critically, not to mention the damage it causes to their eyesight. Television is, of course, a man-made thing, but there is another kind of television, spiritual television. When the human person is renewed spiritually, the eyes of the soul are cleansed, and they can see farther without the aid of machines. Have the parents told their children about this other kind of spiritual television? Before these electronic boxes make them stupid, they should understand spiritual television. Adam and Eve had the gift of foresight, but they lost it when they fell from grace. If the grace of holy baptism is preserved, baptized children will develop spiritual foresight, spiritual television. This requires watchfulness, vigilance, and spiritual work. Today's mothers have lost their spiritual bearings and are preoccupied with worthless and frivolous things. Then they come to me and say, What should I do, Father? I am losing my child. Monastics and Modern Conveniences Geroda how should monastics use modern conveniences? We should always be a bit behind in the quality of the things we use compared to lay people. I feel much better when I use wood for heating, cooking, and handiwork. And when we run out of forests, because of the way that people are exploiting them, I will use whatever is cheap and humble. An oil stove, for example or some other type of heating, and a kerosene lamp to do my handiwork. How can one determine whether something is really essential in a cenobitic monastery? If one thinks in a monastic way, it will be easy to figure it out. If a monastic does not think in a monastic way, then everything becomes a necessity, and the monastic becomes worse than those who live in the world. Monastics must live in humbler circumstances than they did when they lived in the world, never better. We should not have better things here than we did at our homes. In general, the monastery must be poorer than the homes in which we were raised. This helps the monastic with his or her interior life and will also be of help to lay people. By God's providence, people do not find peace 
in possessions and comforts. If laymen are troubled by all these modern comforts, you can imagine how much more these comforts can trouble the monastic. Suppose I found myself in a rich house, and the host asked where I would like to stay, in the living room with the fancy furniture, or in a stable with a couple of goats. I would honestly answer that I prefer the stable with the goats, because I find more peace there. When I left the world to become a monk, I was not seeking a better house or some kind of mansion. My goal was to find something worse than what I had been used to. Otherwise, I am not doing anything for Christ. But today's logic works like this. Why would living in a mansion harm your soul? If you stay in the stable, it's going to stink, while a beautiful house will be full of sweet scents. It will be easier to make your prostrations. We must have a spiritual sensor. In a compass, for example, both arrows have magnets that turn the needle in one direction or the other. Christ has a magnet, too, but we need one ourselves in order to turn towards him. In the old days, life in the Cenobitic monasteries was so hard. I remember the cauldron in the kitchen had a crank to lift it up. We used wood to light the fire and cook. The fire was either too low or too high, and the food would stick to the bottom of the cauldron. When fish got stuck in it, they used a steel broom to scrape the bottom. Then we had to collect the ashes from the fire and place them in a clay jar with a hole underneath to make lye for washing the dishes. It was so rough on our hands, and we lifted the water with a windlass to the Arjuntariki. Some of the things that I see today in monasteries are not justified. In one monastery, I saw the monks cutting bread with a machine. That's not fitting. If a monk is ill or not feeling well, and cannot cut the bread with a knife, and there is a need to cut it, but there is no one else to do it, then using a machine is justified. But when you see a burly monk cutting bread with a slicing machine, you know there's something wrong. This fellow can work a jackhammer, but he uses a machine to cut bread, and considers it an achievement. Make sure that you advance in spiritual matters, and not in machines and comforts. Do not delight in these things. If monasticism loses the spirit of asceticism, the monastic life will have no meaning. If we make convenience the rule of monastic life, we will not prosper. The monastic avoids conveniences because they do not help him spiritually. Even in the world, excessive conveniences make life difficult. But conveniences do not befit a monk, even if he could find comfort in them. We should not seek what is comfortable. During the time of St. Arsenios the Great, they did not have electricity or gas lights, only some fancy lamps in the palace that used very fine oil. St. Arsenios the Great was born in Rome about 354 A.D., he was a man of great wisdom and virtue. He was called Father of Kings because the Emperor Theodosius had entrusted him with the education of his children. In 394, after receiving a divine call, he departed for the desert of Egypt, and from there he went to the Skiti, a wilderness area. Despite the fact that he lived in palaces, he rose to prominence as a monk because of the great austerity of his asceticism. He died in 440 at the age of 86. Couldn't he have brought these lamps with him to the desert? Of course he could, but he did not. He used the cotton wick and seed oil, or whatever was available at that time. We sometimes try to justify the use of machines and other conveniences by claiming that they help us to do our work faster and leave us more time for our spiritual work. But the opposite happens. Our lives become stressful 
and full of concerns and anxieties like the lives of lay people. When a number of young monks joined a certain monastery, the first thing they did was to buy pressure cookers in order to have more time for their spiritual duties, prayer, study, and so on. But instead of doing that, they would just sit and talk for hours. You see, they did not use comforts to save time and use that time for their spiritual benefit. Today, comforts save us time, but there is no time for prayer. Yeroda, I have heard people say that St. Athanasios the Athenite was a progressive. Yes, he was a progressive, but not in the sense that people understand the word today. Let them read the life of St. Athanasios and see the difference. During his time, the monastery had 800 to 1,000 monks, and hundreds of poor and hungry people came looking for help. They gathered at the Lavra Monastery, seeking food and shelter. The saint had even purchased two oxen for the mill in order to cope with all those mouths. Why don't we do the same thing today? He had to create a new type of oven, a novelty for his time, in order to bake enough bread to give to all these people. The Byzantine emperors had endowed monasteries with a lot of land because monasteries served as charitable institutions. These emperors founded and endowed monasteries in order to help lay people spiritually and materially. We must realize that all things will be lost, taken away, and we will find ourselves standing before God in debt. Actually, we monastics should not have even what today's laity throws away. Instead, we should have the worthless junk that the wealthy people of older times used to throw away. You must keep in mind two things. The first is that we are going to die. And the second is that we may not die from natural causes. You should be prepared to die of unnatural causes. If you remember these two things, all will be fine, spiritually and otherwise. Things will work out. Dear listeners, our show has come to an end. Thank you for listening. We will continue where we left off in our next show. Until then, be well. of Orthodox Spirituality. A wondrous journey into Orthodoxy. Prepared and presented by Angeliki Antonaku Lekeak.